What does it truly mean to trust God? What does it truly mean to act from our faith, to live out that faith in the decisions that we make, in the ways that we interact with uncertainty or drama or the crazy chaos of life? How do we let faith support us? As we engage with the world at odds with itself, a world that is aggressive, a world that is uncertain, a world that never seems to stop, always swinging back to hit us on the crackback, regardless of what we try to do, how do we stand tall in that world? How do we trust God? There's a story of a young boy whose father worshipped idols, images of various gods. Not only did the boy's father worship idols, but the man ran a store where village members could come in and buy their own idols for their home use. Idols of every shape and color and size. One day, the boy's father went out and left the boy in charge of the store. While the father was away, the boy picked up an axe and smashed every idol in the store, except for one, a large one, that the boy then put the axe in the hands of. When the boy's father returned home to find the store wrecked and the idols destroyed, everything in ruins, he asked his son what happened. The boy responded that the big idol had become furious at the little idols and destroyed them all with the axe. Don't lie to me, these idols can't move, the boy's father yelled. To which the boy responded, If they cannot protect themselves, why do you pray to them to protect you? It was a bold decision. It was a choice of the boy that showed faith. Faith was more important than the family business. And that following God was the deciding value in that boy's life, a truth that remained throughout that boy's life. Now, I can't tell you what that boy ended up doing for a living, but I can tell you that he got married, and then, at the ripe young age of 75, God called him to go out from his father's land and make a great nation. We hear about this boy later in his life in the book of Genesis, first called Abram, and then Abraham. God picked Abraham, not flippantly, not because Abraham deserved it more or less than anybody else, but because God loved him, simply because God loved him and God chose him. Then, Beginning with Abraham, God passed down a covenant from generation to generation with the people. Not because those descendants and those people did anything exceptional or even right in most cases as we see throughout the Old Testament. But instead, God did this because God loved them. So this is where I'd like to spend a few moments today. Where do we find comfort and support in the words of Scripture. When we go face to face with the world, when it feels like the world is too much, when we need to be reminded that God loves us simply because God does love us. For me, I take a lot of solace in the Psalms, those ancient prayers and hymns and poems that have been handed down from generation to generation. So, I just talked about Abraham. Let's jump 14 generations and get from Abraham to David. It's a commonly held belief that the majority of the Psalms were written by King David, 75 of the 150 in fact, and included in those 75 is Psalm 27, the Psalm for today, the second Sunday in Lent, year C. Now, David, or King David, is an interesting guy because we know just as many good stories as we know bad ones. For every David beating Goliath story, we have David and Bathsheba's story. So in David, we find a person who found themselves in some really high highs and some really low lows. David begins Psalm 27 as a prayer of strength and certainty. Verse 1 goes, and I quote, 
The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? A bold statement of faith, a statement of confidence, a declaration that through God all things are possible. What a beautifully poetic image of faith. But what do we find with this beautifully poetic image of faith when the rubber hits the road? Well, in this very psalm, David lets us know that life is not perfect. In fact, for David, things have gone bad. See, in verse 5, he changes gears, giving voice to what he wants and desires once he is beyond the present danger the present adversary, the present situation. In verse 5, David writes, and I quote, One thing I asked of the Lord, that I will seek after, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. So something has happened. Maybe David is back leading an army and living in a tent because of a situation. Maybe there was another problem outside of the town. We don't know 100%. But something has happened. And in this verse, David is asking God a simple request. That after whatever is happening happens, David might return to the house of the Lord and the community of the faithful where David can be reminded of God's love for him. David's faith in God helps to set his eyes not on the issue that is today, but what will come to pass after the trials at hand have ended. It doesn't take any time for us to look around our city, our nation, or our world and to see the trials and tribulations at hand. With shots fired in the Ukraine over the past few weeks, with shots fired in Columbus at the intersection of 270 and 71 on Friday. So the question is, what do we do in the face of such a world? What do we do when our world seems out of control, when we feel like things are broken, when we feel like anything we may try to attempt will fall short? I believe that our first step is remembering that God loves us, and God has chosen each and every one of us, paid for all of creation in the blood of Christ, and welcomed us in the waters of baptism. In the face of the world's craziness and chaos, I pray that on this day you let the words of Scripture remind you that we are not alone because God loves us. God, who is our light and our salvation, the stronghold of our lives, and that it is with divine strength that God holds our lives, each and every one of us. Today I pray that you find a familiar reminder in those pages that we call holy, a reminder that God's faithfulness is unending. When the rubber hits the road that we all find in those scriptures passed across our faith, not shallow platitudes or overused superlatives, but reminders that we are called to be people of faith, We are called to trust God because with God all things are possible, not because of us, but by what God can do through us. We walk this walk of faith together because of what God is doing through us. We pray for each other. We support one another. We are an enclave of hope. We are a sanctuary from the world outside for the world outside because of what God is doing through us. We continue in our walk of faith with those who throughout Scripture have also walked the zigzagged paths of their own lives, making that choice to follow God with every footstep, good days and bad days. We walk with Abraham, who carries with him the memories of broken childhood idols and the illusions of grandeur he left in piles at his father's feet. Abraham, who continued to have an unending and childlike faith all the days of his life. We walk with David, who could do anything with the support of God, and yet continued to stumble as he attempted to do everything that he wanted to. 
We join the great parade that follows God from wherever our lives' journeys have brought us, letting God love us, because that is what God does. Even when the pieces don't fit together, even when the world outside is scary, even when we don't exactly know how things ended up the way they did, we let God love us, because that is what God does. Because there is only one with the strength to set things right. There is only one who is always, always there with us. There is only one who sent the Son, the Son who takes his hands that were nailed down by the chaos and ugliness of the world and uses those nail-scarred hands to reposition eternity, embracing the cosmos in his arms. Because loving creation is what God does. Amen.